I've hit the record um, button there with everybody. We still have a few people joining at 6.05, so we will continue to admit people as they join. Just a few housekeeping rules here, please, if you can just keep your phones um, muted, that would be great, so that we don't have any unexpected sounds coming through. Um, we would definitely appreciate that um, to all of you if we can just keep our phones uh, muted here. Um, outside of that, we will get our ball rolling here pretty, pretty quickly as we um, work to get ourselves started. And I'm just admitting a few people in again so that we can um, get things rolling. But thank you. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. Um, it'll be an amazing time here. So as I speak, let me see how many people we have on. We have just about 37 people on already. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and this, this event is being streamed as well. So we're gonna have um, people joining us um, as we go ahead um, to get this evening going. I got more people joining, so I gotta keep letting them in as they come. But while we actually do that, I don't wanna miss any part of this. So I will give um, one more minute and then we will go straight on with the show, getting Aunt Mario um, to get us started. Um, okay. So we'll start in about one minute. Yes, sir. Perfect. Um, so those who are with me on um, my Instagram, I'm doing a talk with uh, Leo at Empowerment Squared. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk um, about a full range of topics, uh, including, um, you know, the charitable organization that he operates in, in Hamilton, and as well as, you know, the diversity and inclusion in um, in, in the space that we are in today. So if you feel kind of weird, do not. We are also streaming live on Instagram and Mario is making sure all of our viewers there are also up to speed. Mm -hmm. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. We will get the ball rolling here. And um, I will start by going to Mario to introduce himself. And tell us who he is, actually. You may not have known this, but Mary also has an, an immigration story. As uh, many of you may be aware at Empowerment Square, we work with a lot of families and young people who come to Canada as newcomers. So we would love to hear from Mary as he introduces himself and give us a little bit of insight into who he really is and, and, and his own joining here to Canada. Mario, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much, Leo, and uh, thank you for opening up the space for me and for other people to listen in on. Um, you know, I, so I migrated to um, to Hamilton, actually, where Empowerment Squared is back in 2000. So it was a decision after my parents divorced my mom, you know, she became a single parent and it was uh, increasingly difficult for her to find work on the island in Turks and Caicos. So, you know, we made a decision to move to Canada and it was one of the toughest decisions that we collectively as a family had to make. And I remember, you know, we had to, um, we had to go to uh, food banks and we, we needed support. And I remember we were scrambling around looking for places to sleep, not, you know, how not to freeze to death um, during the different seasons of Canada. And I remember it just being like, um, quite difficult, but I could also see that other people suffered even more than than what we suffered, you know, because my mom, she always made uh, the struggle seem like a beautiful thing by you know, turning it into an adventure, which is also where I get this adventure kind of um, juice from, if you would say that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mario, for just sharing a little bit of that. And I know we will get to some of the details as we as we go along, um, a different aspects of it. But I myself, um, just listening to you coming to Canada um, as a government sponsored refugee in 2006, um, I, I can just imagine when I got here, there was a lot going on um, in my head. So just sitting here and sometimes listening to the stories of the hundreds of young people that we serve who also come here um, as newcomers, many of them from different refugee camps around the world or from countries that have gone through some horrific um, crises and wars and getting here and just trying to understand what's ahead for them. But I want to come down to this whole um, idea and, 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 and topic around equal, as an equal explorer. Um, I myself, this was a very new 
terminology to me the first time we met a um, few, I think two years ago or so when we, when we chatted and I've never heard of it. And, and as a result of meeting you, I decided to go into it a little bit. And we, I must admit, this is not a popular space or popular thing um, in our community, especially in the black <laughs> community in general. So tell us, what is it, Mario? So and explore, you know, explorers have changed throughout time uh, from the beginning of mankind. If we go back to Africa, who were the first people to have explored? They were African people who had left Africa and spread throughout Eurasia. And um, that's how the world has been populated. It's because of explorers, because people who were brave enough to, to, um, to go into the unknown frontier, um, they had to cross Arctic, uh, you know, lands they had to cross the Bering Straits, cross deserts and uh, thick jungles through South America and, and places like that. So an explorer has evolved over time based on the needs of humanity, but that explorer has always been there um, because what we kind of do is we do discovery research, scientific research, um, and go to places that haven't really been discovered before. And so that kind of defines, um, you know, fundamentally what an explorer is and what they do. Um, and so I'm really kind of uh, gravitated toward the exploration mixed in with adventure. So not only do I want to explore places that uh, few people have explored or are very hard to look, uh, hard to, um, uh, to read about, but I also want to make sure that the places that I do discover are you know, respected and uh, at the same time, uh, teach other people to tread lightly to the places that they visit and the communities in which they involve themselves, uh, you know, into. Uh, we've had a long string of uh, explorers who had, who made it a bad rap, like, you know, some of the, the greats like Christopher Columbus, for instance, who <laughs> traveled around uh, the wrong side of the world and uh, discovered, you know, the other side. And uh, because of, you know, his, his, um, his actions that didn't really take into consideration humanity ended up wiping out um, uh, millions of indigenous communities there, and then also bringing slaves and from Africa to to work in the in the West Indies and in the Caribbean. So, um, what the definition of an explorer today for me is someone who, uh, because so many places have been discovered already, it's more about how to discover. Um, places and connected with other places. So it's more about connecting. It's about bridging gaps. It's about uh, connecting societies and humanity together. And uh, before we become multi-planetary species, we have to understand who we are here on earth first. So it goes above and beyond. And that's the forefront of my thought. And the, the secondary um, thing that happened is, is I happen to be a black man. And you know that brings about uh, a different angle to the whole exploration world. <laughs> That's yeah, that is fascinating. As I as I listen to you, I'm, I'm just a lot of things are running through my head here. Um, but before we go ahead, I just wanted to do a few um, housekeeping things. Also, those of you who are watching us on Instagram or on on Facebook, um, you can also participate. Um, you can put your questions um, in the comment session somebody will be able to pull your questions out from there and make sure when the time is right, we can ask Mario your questions. And those of you who are watching us on Zoom as well, um, the, the chat session of Zoom, if you have, as questions come to your mind as we go along, please make sure you put those questions there. We'll definitely have some time for Mario to look at those questions and comments as well. If you want to share something quickly with Mario, just put them in the comments and we'll be able to pull them up. Also, as you all know, this event is a free event. So we are just um, letting everyone know if you feel led and I able to, you can go to our website to make a goodwill donation directly. Um, the link for our website will be in the Zoom chat. And those of you watching on Facebook, or on Instagram, um, you can just Google Empowerment Squared or Empowerment Squared dot org to go and make your donations but mario let me let me just get back to you um, we're in very difficult times um we all have seen um from covid 19 that has exposed um some of the difficult situations our community has been dealing with for a very very long time and i like to remind people that um giving systemic um racism and injustices that are well recorded um in our histories everywhere 
some of which we're still dealing with, has led to, to a huge deficit when it comes to, to development in our community. And sometimes it's at a point where um, the community is getting blamed for dealing mm -hmm. with, with the very deficit that has been created as a result of, of the things that we've seen done um, historically. And we can say the same for our indigenous communities as well, right. uh, um, as we actually speak about this. I wanna ask you, what led you down this path um, mm -hmm. uh, as an individual? Um, mm -hmm. What really led you down to try and go down this path that many in our communities have never gone into or would have even considered um, um, I'm going into? I think in order to make uh, you know major changes, and particularly changes for the, I would say, the betterment of humanity, which is to have more inclusion and diversity in all fields, because you know it's better to have a um, uh, you know a spiced food than just a plain meal. Um, and so, for me, you know, I'm coming in as just a, a single piece of spice when there are so many different varieties that can um, be added to the fields that I'm in. And so I'd like to see more women. I'd like to see more um, people of color and able bodies um, uh, or people who, who find it uh, uh, to, to struggle to explore and, and, and uh, who don't have access to, to the tools necessary to do the things that I do. And I came from that space and I thought I'd use myself as a guinea pig by going out and exploring places that um, would have been almost impossible to go unless you took an, a gigantic um, sacrifice. And, you know, I gamble against my life. I gamble against, um, you know, uh, losing my friends, my family, and uh, the material possessions that I left behind in Toronto when I decided to go on this uh, voyage of walking across Africa. I decided to drop everything. And I did that because of uh, multiple reasons. One of them was, I'll tell you two reasons. Um, one of them was that, you know, I was going through this kind of crisis in my head um, that I wasn't really following a path of, of, of purpose. And so I wanted to follow a purposeful driven life because to me, that was the way to express um, my love to myself and also back to humanity. Because when you do the things that you love to do, you're sharing that with everyone else and they're benefiting off of that as well. Um, and then, so the second reason is that I wanted to create a change <laughs> on, on earth through humanity. And uh, you know, if it's possible or not, I just wanted to go dive in and see if it is possible. You know, whether I make a big change or not is actually something um, that, that, that doesn't, um, rule my my thoughts but at least to try to try and go out there and, and like how can i influence uh, change how can i influence change for the better and i thought that uh, like the movie uh black panther that you, most people have heard of <laughs> but there is a show the show used to uh called the black panther as well was on bet that people hardly ever heard about at the time when i was watching it and um you know uh T'Challa, the king of Wakanda, who before he became king, after his father had died, needed uh, to do some soul searching. And so he did this, um, you know, this walkabout where he went throughout, um, he went throughout Africa on foot <laughs> to basically find himself, but also to find what was his community about? What was the continent in which he lived in? What was it really about? He wanted to find authenticity, he wanted to find truth. And that resonated with me since I was a child until even today and moving forward. It was a, it was an, a deep sense of curiosity, a deep sense of empathy and care uh, for humanity in general. And I was always curious about how, how that really looked like if I took it to the, to the ultimate level. And to me, that ultimate level was to do that expedition and then um, you know, I have plans to do more expeditions and more things in the future that I hope will um, make some impactful changes. Yeah, you just unpacked a lot of things here right now. Right? <laughs> Everything from 
stepping out of your comfort zone, everything from finding ways to channel your ability and, and your talents and, and, and your gifts in, in, in ways that can be impactful, not just to yourself as a person, but also to your community and, and, and to people around you. I wanna take this conversation somewhere, um, I'm building on what you just, some of the things you just talked about. Uh, the Black community, as many of us have seen what happened, the unfortunate incident that happened with George Floyd um, in Minnesota. I mean, for some of us, it's, it, it wasn't a surprise because for a long time we've been confronted with, with these realities. And it's just been difficult sometimes for people to believe it, that it was true when, when you say these stories, right? People struggle to accept that that could, could happen uh, because we didn't have cameras or whatever for people to tape it live. And people would even look at you like you're making up the story, it's not possible. And something like George Floyd happened and things erupted. Um, and we saw all these solidarity speeches and messages, you know, from friends, from, from allies. And, mm -hmm. and something ran through my mind. When I looked at some of the solidarity messages, I could literally remove the date 2020 and put 10 years ago date on it and it looked the exact same when I saw some mm -hmm. of the press, press re releases. As a community, we've come to a place where we're saying to our allies, to friends, and even to ourselves, that we've been fighting for a long time. However, what we haven't seen is the same energy on the building side. Our community is dealing with a lot of deficit. And the truth is no one can help us build better than ourselves. And to our friends and allies is this message that we're trying to send that we got to fight with one hand and build with the other hand. So the same energy you bring to the fighting side, whether it's the rallies or the protests, which we greatly appreciate, we're hoping that you can bring that same energy, ability and resources to the building side as we deal with the real problems that we have to continue to do to, to really be at a place that we can take on these challenges. Mary, I want you to, to take us down, down your thoughts about um, how we deal with this, well, how we find a balance with yeah. fighting for justice, fighting for equality and equal rights. And at the same time, how do we figure out to not overwhelm ourselves and continue building? Um, during, um, you know, BLM has been going on for a long time before it was BLM. And I knew the stats about how many black men were being murdered by police officers. Um, I think it was like 350 average yearly when I looked at the stats back in 2000, like 2015, just before I walked Africa. And, you know, a lot of people said, what you're doing is dangerous. <laughs> you're walking the continent of Africa, you're gonna die for sure. And I said, um, if you were a black man in the ghetto <laughs> um, or even in a, in a impoverished area in, in the United States of America, uh, the likelihood of, of you dying is probably higher. Um, and so, you know, it's about risk assessment in that sense in my head, but how the things have unraveled is, is, is quite spectacular because I think it's a combination of what's been happening with COVID and having people uh, be inside and not be as dis distracted, allow them to, to actually listen because, you know, you can't really turn your head anywhere. It's constantly in your face. It's through your social media uh, feed and um, after you have 10 messages of BLM um, thrown at you, you're probably gonna want to, you know, take a look and, and, and try to investigate. Okay, fine. After five times, you're gonna say, well, let me look into this a little bit. And so that's what's been happening to a certain extent. Um, but it's always been like that. And to what you were saying, you know, we should put it, uh, as much effort into building. I think that's huge and that's exactly what I wanted to do with Walking Africa. I wanted to, and you know, I say build in the sense that I wanted to go into a field that was uh, traditionally unknown for black people to be in. However, what a lot of people don't realize is that some of the greatest explorers have been African people or people of African descent. Um, you know, there is a guy named Matthew Hansen, which I'll get back to. And then there's, um, uh, who's that uh, African explorer uh, back in, you know, a long time during the Ottoman Empire, he was the wealthiest man that's ever lived. And he had traveled all around the, uh, the known uh, uh, world. In the Hansa East. Kanka Musa. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, he was one of the greatest explorers. He's gone all, all around the world um, in the known world. And so um, Matthew Hansen is an explorer 
just like um, uh, Hansa, who uh, was the first person to make it to the North Pole. However, uh, his recognition has been stripped away from him. And he decided, um, you know, I'm going to take this approach in a calm way and, 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 and not express that, uh, my anger or my, um, my frustration because this was during the time where uh, slavery was just abolished. And so for over a century, he has not been recognized to be the first human being to make it to the North Pole. He's the black man. And he led a, a group of people with him as well. So not only was he the first one, but he was also a leader. And, uh, you know, only, I think, uh, a hundred sorry, century later, was he then recognized, of course, after his death and, you know, he can't celebrate anymore. But it's been forgotten in the history books. Uh, it's not been popularized. It's not been, you know, in any plays. And so all the effort of this individual uh, black man has been uh, squashed away. And even though they resurrected his, his record, you know, it's not been talked about or anything like that. One of my expeditions that I want to do in the future is to basically retrace his footsteps, Matthew Hansen, to, to walk across the North Pole. A lot of people look at me and they think I'm crazy. And, uh, you know, to a certain extent, I am I think, crazy, uh, which is fine. I think that's a healthy approach to think that you're crazy if you're doing crazy things. But it's also to commemorate this incredible individual not only for himself, but also for the confidence of the people in our community, for, for people of color, for black people, to see that there are brave people and it is within our blood. If you look at the history of how black people have been treated in the last 450 years, you know, we've had to put our heads down and be afraid of all the things that have happened to us. And I am so incredibly tired of that, that I'm doing the thing that I'm doing now to show not only for myself, but to show the rest of humanity that we can all do this. And in fact, it's in our blood. It's been, it's always been in our blood to be masters of explorers, to traverse the continent, to do brave things. And in order to do that, you need to, you need to be intelligent. You need to listen. You need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be able to communicate with uh, tribes that are from many different places. That is amazing. Um, I have probably two more questions for you because we already got questions coming in um, from our audience. So we're glad to see our audience being engaged. Um, and then we will kind of go into our question period so you can have some time to be able to address questions from our audience as well. But Mike, uh, one of the things I want, I, I want to hear your thoughts on, um, Mario, as we, we go down in thinking of how um, post-COVID will look like, whatever that new reality is, in terms of community building, um, in terms of reaching out to some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, um, whether it's in uh, marginalized communities like the Black community or Indigenous community or other marginalized communities as well. I just, I sit here and think to myself, there is um, an air of caution on a lot of people who are not members of the Black community. Right, there is this fear of not wanting to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or or rob people the wrong way. Just the level of sensitivity that that this has created is is, is causing a problem because then it's made it difficult for even friends and allies of the community to engage in an in an authentic way um, for the fear that there may be backlash if I get something wrong or if I'm misunderstood and you know to to be acting inappropriately. And this goes through all sectors, whether it's in the education sector, in the health sector, everywhere. People are holding back rather than being able to open up in ways that we can constructively deal with the challenges that we see, things like systemic racism in, in everywhere that we actually see it. I would like to hear your thoughts on how do we navigate this space to empower our friends, empower our allies, to deal with, with systemic racism when we see it, but to also make sure we are empowering friends and allies and, and seizing the opportunities for education, for the exchange and sharing of knowledge around these very difficult topics. Yeah, so first of all, you know, um, the people who inflict uh, restrictions on us and who imprison us, who enslave us, you know, th these people are afraid uh, themselves. These people um, are afraid and therefore, you know, need to put us in a certain place. And 
to me, that shows that, you know, we are powerful and we are strong beyond um, what we can possibly imagine. And we've been lied to, we've been duped for so long. And I think that, that I, I, I keep, keep trying to reiterate this message that we've been duped for so long because our strength and our intelligence, our creativity, our craftsmanship has been um, uh, taught to us to be a, 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 a service to the, to the white man for a long time. And, uh, you know, that is no longer the case. And I think it's never been the case. It's just that we've been duped into it. And a lot of those feelings and a lot of those emotions have been passed on from the, from the past. And, you know, it's been brought to our, um, to our behavior and our culture today, whether you're in Africa, in North America, in the Caribbean, it doesn't matter. The diaspora has all been affected the same um, sort of way uh, by putting our heads down. And so in this new era, we, the only thing we can really do, and this question has been asked to me by um, a lot of individuals, actually um, youth, particularly black youth, they ask me this because they really do want to find a way to escape this prison inside of them. And that's exactly what it is. It's like a cage and a prison inside, inside your head and inside your chest. And in order for me to have been freed by that, it really scared me. It was a very frightening experience. It was one of the most frightening experiences I've ever had because for the first time had I left the cave and I went outside and I saw reality, you know? And um, when that happened, it was just kind of like a roller coaster because I exponentially started to understand my strengths. I started to understand that I can be my own individual uh, being. So a lot of these youth, uh, the black youth, they ask me, how as we as a people, how can we overcome barriers? How can we overcome fear? And uh, what are the steps that we need to do to, to get there? And you know, it's not easy. It's not easy because it's not something that's common in our culture. In, in a culture where something is not common and you, you put something that's unique uh, in that culture, it's gonna have resistance. It's gonna have a lot of resistance. And that person who is driving that force, who is driving that new, that new um, 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 addition to the culture is going to have to step up the plate and do 10 times as much more than any other individual because he's resisting the culture and he's resisting uh, people who've been suppressing that culture. And I think knowing that in itself will help you actually move forward. Because I see a lot of people in our community who try to move forward and I hear too many complaints and not enough actions. I'm not saying everyone, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to be discouraged and to think that the world is too big and you're small, you know, because that's essentially how we've been taught our entire lives. It is only my mother who taught me to, you know, to stand up, to, my, to put my head up high and to walk with confidence and to know that I am capable of anything. And because of my, you know, strong mother, I'm able to become the person that I am today. So the, the, the first move that anyone can really do is to make the move in the first place without excuses. That is probably the fundamentally most important thing. <laughs> is to make the move without making any excuses. If you move forward, that is a much bigger step than 90% of all of your peers. Because the first, I think the biggest problem is people not taking the action in the first place. And all it just requires a small step. It's just a, a tiny little movement. And that movement um, starts to, to, to build up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Amari. And I will also say to our friends and everyone else from other communities that it never hurts to ask, right? If you don't understand, mm. I often say seek to understand, right? It's a very powerful thing because we all cannot pretend like we know everything. And uh, these are problems that have been embedded in our culture for so long that sometimes we don't even realize, right? It, it, it happens without you even realizing what is going on. So I often say to people, seek to understand, ask. People will always be willing to, to uh, share it with you rather than not willing. But let me ask you this. Um, how have you managed, Mario, to use your experience, whether it's in ecotourism or some of the things that you do, the type of work that you do, 
to really drive um, attention and focus on the causes that you care about, what is education, what is, 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 is children, like the causes that, that really you personally care about. How have you been able to, to use um, the ability that you have and your entry into this um, space of eco, um, of eco exploration um, that is not very representative of your community? How have you been able to use it as a, as a powerful tool for driving change and bringing attention to the things you care about? How have I used um, this platform as a tool um, uh, to elevate myself and others? Uh, and, and before I get to that, I wanted to actually add to what you were saying is, you know, ask to move forward. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm the first person to, to say that I knew nothing about walking across Africa. I knew nothing about kayaking across the Great Lakes or cycling across uh, the North American continent. I just did it. I just did it. And through the process of doing it, you start to ask questions and then those questions become answers. If you ask the question, the answer will come, you know, whether it's Google or someone else, it doesn't matter. It will eventually come. And so Leo, I'm absolutely in agreement with you that that's one of the important steps is, is to ask how, um, and don't be afraid of that. I think a, particularly a lot of uh, young, young black men are afraid to look weak. And that's been our biggest culprit in our culture. And that I think that is, is something that uh, needs some some serious uh, upgrading <laughs> because I think there is strength in vulnerability. There is strength in, in, in opening up and, and asking the questions or even allowing um, you know, your, your fellow uh, female partners to sometimes take the lead and sometimes you take the lead, but there's this balance. And I think we need to focus more on that drive. Um, in terms of how, how the platform that I'm in, how I've been able to help myself and also the community is it's a slow, uh, it's been a slow process that I've been working on for over seven years now. I remember when I first got into, you know, adventuring exploration, it was, uh, I was basically laughed out of every single uh, office, <laughs> every single uh, brand company that was an outdoor company. They, they thought it would it'd be a joke. They're like, all right, get out of here, man. Like, you know, um, so I didn't get, um, I didn't get many sponsors or anything like that. And over time, I just, I just stuck with it. I kept sticking with it, you know, and because this is what I love to do. I will continue to keep doing the things that I love to do. And eventually when you keep doing the thing that you love to do, you'll become good at it. And when you become good at it, there'll be value behind it. And people will eventually um, um, reward you in terms of payment. Um, and so that's what's been happening. And the more I, I get into this field, the bigger the platforms will be. Um, let's say I work with National Geographic in a couple of months from now, as an example, I'm able to, A, just by being a black person, I'm representing now a new face that explores places that isn't uh, the quintessential white man who is looking uh, down at a community and saying, oh, like poor little things, you know, it's no longer that. It's more like me going out there exploring and, um, and understanding the sameness of each other. And I think that's where my focus is really is this um, how are we similar as opposed to traditional explorers who thought, oh, I need to go to this place because I want to see how different they are. Look how different they are. Look at, look at their noses, look at their hair, look at, their, look at this. This is a very horrible approach. <laughs> I think it's uh, disconnected us, um, especially the Western world. Um, and it also allows me to really reach into my two favorite things, um, uh, that I like to do with my expeditions is to connect it to charitable organizations. So I always connect it with a charitable organization that, um, uh, that has to do with sustainability. Um, and then the other one is education. So those are my two top um, uh, charitable organizations of which I always connect with during any or all my expeditions. Um, and sustainability, it, it comes in, 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 in form of environmental um, impact. So to me, that's very important. When I rode my bike across Canada, I saw a lot of uh, environmental injustice, which was to me racism, because a lot of these lands that were some of the worst lands you could possibly um, you know, have were 
given to the indigenous people, or I wouldn't say given to the indigenous people because they were there before all of us. Um, it was left over for the indigenous people. And so I didn't see any land that was, um, you know, the rich and fertile um, only for them to, to thrive on. And of course, you know, you can go to none of it in the north where it's freezing cold and they kind of leave that for them to, to, um, <laughs> to survive on. So environmental justice for me is, 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 is huge and it's important because it also leads into systemic uh, racism. And uh, it also, uh, you know, I think it, it, it also dictates the opportunity possibilities of individual, individuals living in these circumstances. So if you're living in a, in a land that has uh, um, poor resources and no access to, to um, infrastructure, then those individuals in that community are never gonna have the chance to make it up to where the rest of the, the, the world is. And so, and, and oh, sorry. And then in, in concluding that really is, you know, the bigger my platform, the more I really um, am able to hit on uh, those messages. And I'm doing it in my own way. And there are many people who are doing it in their, in their unique way. There's no one way to do it. Um, the tip that Leah was, was saying, which is, um, you know, ask the question, that's universal though. It doesn't matter what you're into. It doesn't matter if you're Martin Luther King Jr. or, you know, a LeBron James, you are asking, you have to ask questions to get to where you need to get to. And so there's a universal truth, which, which is what you just said, but then we can go about it in many different ways. Thank you, Mary. I'll take this time now to go to questions from our audience. I have one more around how did you prepare for this, but we can do that to wrap the show, to wrap it up um, this evening. But let me take questions. We've got a few questions that have come in already. This one is from Jacobo Simba. Jacobo says, what are some of, or what are the greatest challenges you face in a field predominantly um, um, dominated by, by, by Westerners or by white people? Um, and then I will add this one to it. I also says from Ecstatics by Angel, so what are smaller ways we can step out of our comfort zones? The, um, so for me, what works really in my mind, I'll tell you mentally what I go through in order to, um, to, to, to survive these situations, like being in a boardroom uh, full of um, you know, people who've traditionally been there and all of a sudden I'm this newcomer. You know, first of all, I block out, um, uh, not block out, that's another, you know, I, I essentially think purely about the fact that at the end of the day, I have a goal and I want to accomplish this goal. So it's not that I'm blocking out anything else. It's just that this is my main focus. Am I a black man? Yes. And so I'm aware of that. And, uh, you know, if I see people acting funny around me, then uh, I, uh, and again, it's different based on uh, who you are, but for me, I see it as an educational um, opportunity. So I, you know, try to encourage people to to think uh, outside of the box. And the way I do that is by showing it. I am more of a person who likes to show than to tell. And you know, so when I'm cycling across Canada, for instance, I no one can question the fact that oh, like black people can't ride bikes, or black people can't swim. You know, and I kayak across the lake and stuff like that. And you know, I just like to close the chapter on a lot of things. And for me, that's the most powerful weapon you have, really, is by leading through example, really. So when I'm in a room uh, full of people who, you know, I'm not their traditional um, uh, figurehead, um, it actually empowers me because it gives me an opportunity to, to, to teach, to educate. Um, I was once at, a, at a, a talk at the Explorers Club, which is a highly renowned um, uh, club for explorers, scientific research and whatnot. And uh, I had to do a talk about my expedition across Africa, but I used that opportunity to really talk about uh, being black in the explorers world. And 99.9% .9 of these people that were in the audience were older white men. And, uh, you know, and I came at it from a educational, um, perspective, but also through an empathetic perspective, you know, basically explaining to them uh, how I see exploration. And, uh, you know, I think that that um, 
resonated with them because after that I became um, a member of the Explorers Club. So, you know, people are looking for these changes. And of course, right now is um, a time that's very uh, sensitive because of B the BLM movement that's happened in the past. And um, I was talking to uh, a producer in LA and he was saying that, you know, this, and he, you know, he's a white man. And he was telling me, he said like, listen, this is um, an opportunity for, for us to really get in there quickly and make your move and make your mark. Um, if you wait too long, it's gonna be too late because um, eventually there's gonna be this backlash where people are saying, well, you can't just like, you know, um, uh, hire just anyone who doesn't have the experience. Um, so if, if you have an opportunity to do something that you really want to do, and if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a, di a different able body, right now is the opportunity to go in and to follow that path and that dream that you really wanted to do. You, can, you cannot wait uh, much longer. It'll be much more difficult to get into it, but right now is the time. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Mario. And I'll also just say to Angel about practical ways you can step out of your comfort zone is do it within your means, right? Mm -hmm. Don't try to think you can save the world or don't try to think it's <laughs> a whole community. Always mm -hmm. act within your means. Find what you like, find what you can do, find what you, you, you have the ability or the resources to be able to actually do because by doing that, you will surprise yourself as to what you may attract. Um, in the actual process. I will give you two more, let you take two more questions, um, 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 Mario. One comes from one of our guests by the name of George. As an explorer, should we seek to discover and connect with all people or should we leave the so-called undiscovered tribes alone? Um, I'll let you take that one by itself because it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a big question. Go ahead. Yeah, that is a big question. And uh, everything is, is a, um, a case by case uh, situation. I personally would try to leave the, the tribes alone, in especially indigenous communities that don't wanna to be touched. Um, typically what you would do is you would talk to a chief, uh, you would communicate with the chief of, of a village or a community, and that person speaks on the behalf of the people. Particularly, it would be successful if um, the chief was um, uh, highly respected by, by the community. And um, if the chief says no, you, you cannot enter and, and we, we're, we're trying to close our doors to foreigners, then that should be respected 100%. Um, but if you're in a situation where um, uh, this tribe wants to go out and explore and, and invite uh, tourists and invite visitors, then uh, you know we can do that, but we should tread lightly. And we should know better because um, from the experiences that we've that we've had in, in history, we know some of the consequences that could happen by having foreigners going to foreign land um, that has not been exposed to the rest of the world. Um, you know, like COVID would be um, times ten over there had we go into those communities. I actually had an option to to go to none of it to do an expedition, and it was supposed to um, actually. Uh, be in the summertime, but instead I did the kayaking Lake Ontario uh, expedition. The reason I didn't do it was because, um, you know, they closed the borders and I had access to go through the border with uh, Parks Canada, but we decided, me and my team, that we're not going to do this because it, it's not worth the risk to, to you know, to harm uh, these people. And I think that we, as, as humanity, sometimes we just need to take it easy and just let go. <laughs> just, just let them be, you know, just let, I don't know, we're, I think the Western society, we're very, um, we're very militant on getting things done, <laughs> which yes. is ridiculous. Even when it comes to like being happier and like doing yoga, people have turned yoga from this like uh, beautiful practice into like this militant must do activity um, so they're forcing happiness, they're forcing comfort, they're forcing all these different things. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's an opportunity to be misaligned with the flow of life, with the flow of the universe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, our next question here is from Nancy McPhee. And the question is, have you found that adventure, have you found that the adventure community is welcoming to diverse people? <laughs> 
Uh, so that's a good question because it, it depends who you're asking, really. I've had a lot of moments where people have not been very, um, you know, uh, forgiving uh, to, to see me in the community. Like I, I've been at events where I'm the, the, the lead, the, the head speaker and, um, or teaching as well. And they thought that I was just part of the audience. And uh, so they wouldn't believe that, you know, this person could be me. <laughs> so there's that. And what I say to that is, you know, just keep doing your thing and keep, keep being uh, persistent with your message and with what you believe and what you stand for, as long as you're being true to yourself. And eventually, you know, not everyone's going to resonate with your message. Not everyone's going to resonate with, with you being in the outdoor, with me being in the outdoors. And that's okay. I'm actually okay with that. What I'm really um, striving for, what I'm focusing on is, is giving um, the opportunities for, uh, for underprivileged uh, youth and people of color, the opportunity to see me and um, that translate to making decisions in their life easier if they wanted to do something um, that was challenging or, or they were fearful of doing that. To me, I, I completely focus on that and that's what drives me to keep moving forward. And you know, the people who did um, disapprove of of who I am and what I'm doing, you know, um, I won't get 100% of them, but I will probably get 35% of them. And to me, that's enough. And, uh, you know, it's all about small gains over time. Uh, you're not, as you said earlier, don't try to completely try to change the system. You'll, you'll lose, you will completely lose. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. We have questions flowing in. I'll try to squeeze them in. <laughs> we have probably 10 to 15 minutes to wrap things up. I'll, I'll try to answer earlier, uh, quicker as well. Sorry. Yeah. So we have a question from Instagram from Aria Ninia, who's watching. And the question is, how do you approach learning local languages when you travel? We also have another question from Larry Pekin. I'll give you both of them at the same time. And Larry wants to know, how long did you live in Hamilton? And was it a positive experience in your personal growth? Uh, okay, so languages, it depends on which language. I actually struggled um, a lot with, uh, when I was in Mozambique with Portuguese for some reason. And although I, you know, I speak uh, um, you know, pretty um, a decent Spanish, but uh, Portuguese was a, a huge struggle. But then I went to Swahili, uh, to you know, the Swahili regions like East Africa in, uh, Mal well, not Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, those regions. And I essentially became fluent in Swahili almost overnight. And that's because to me, I felt like uh, it resonated with me a, a little bit better, a little bit more. And also Swahili is quite an easy language to, to, to pick up and learn. Um, where Portuguese is a little bit more of a, it's an older language. There's a lot more um, nuances that are, are hard to get to. But the number one thing I would do is I would, I would try to master my top 10 uh, phrases that I would need to um, learn for survival purposes. Um, so like, you know, um, I am a, I'm sporting, I'm doing a sporting event uh, by walking uh, Africa. Uh, I need water, food. Uh, I need help. Uh, you know, all these different things. I, I think that's important. So, and I think by tr by mastering those 10 phrases really helps connect you to that culture because you have to say it in a certain way too. You can't just like say it like in the way that you say it in the Western uh, perspective. My number one goal for every language that I had to learn, which I think I like 15 different languages along the way, is I had to understand how to say those phrases so that the, the, the tribe or the, the, the community there would understand me as a, a, a local as close as possible. That was my ultimate goal. And so because, you know, it wasn't just about like, oh, I wanna learn the language. It was more like, I wanna master a phrase so well that they think I'm like from there. But only that one phrase. I don't. I don't need to learn the entire language, and then that actually helps overcome that, like uh, you know, frustration of like I can't get those words. I keep forgetting those words because now you've elevated your brain at a higher level to understand a lot more, right? It's just again, it's just like when you see a bunch of uh, people that look like you doing something uh, incredible. 
um, it's easier for you to do that now because you've seen it and your brain is at a higher level. And um, I think it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a beauty to, to learn these languages, to be fully in, uh, uh, versed in them and to understand the, the, the phrases and the, and the dialect. In terms of Hamilton, uh, <laughs> I lived there for, I, you know what, I can't remember how long I lived there for, but I think it was around three, four years. And then I went to university at Western and then from uh, Western, I, I moved to Toronto. So uh, Hamilton to me was uh, a very unique area because I would say it was like a melting pot of cultures coming uh, together. A lot of uh, immigrants would come to, to Hamilton, including us. And it's a perfect uh, ground because, you know, we're not quite deep in the big city like Toronto, where things are moving a lot faster and, and people might care less individually for each person. But Hamilton is like that perfect middle ground where you can, uh, you can live downtown or you can live a little bit further out. You can live on the escarpment. And uh, I think there are so many opportunities there for you to, to grow as a newcomer. And it did that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Myra, for sharing your thoughts. I will take our next question here. Um, that comes from Nancy McPhee again. It says, can you please talk about persistence? Is there a correlation between persistence in your expeditions and persistence in your life? But now I would like to ask the highlight question of the entire event. It comes from Cecily, who is six years old. And Cecily oh. is asking you, what does expedition mean? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. You know what? Actually, I'm surprised not enough people ask that question. And the funny thing is, um, Cecile, thank you for asking that question. Um, I had to learn what that meant as well. And um, I'm still at this point where, oh, like, you know, borderline don't know what that means. But, it, you know, an expedition essentially to me is a, um, a route or a project in which has a, um, a beginning and end with a purpose. And, you know, so to me, an expedition could be like to traverse um, uh, Lake Ontario, but not just to traverse it, but to actually also um, have some either research from my, ex from my uh, journey, from my expedition. And then from this research, I'm able to turn that into data and share that with people or, um, you know, have an end goal of a specific thing. Like I need to make sure that I get there in 20 days or something like that. So to me, these are very kind of like goal oriented uh, missions, projects. Um, so it's kind of different than a journey. A journey is like, you're kind of, you know, uh, going through the motion of, uh, a process of traveling or even in your mind, you can have a journey in your mind. Um, and it's not quite like traveling because traveling uh, could be to a destination, but uh, there's no um, uh, goal specifically for that uh, other than the fact that you are traveling. So an expedition kind of has that refined and defined um, a goal and expectation at the end. All right, and the next one was about um, persistence and the correlation between persistence in your expeditions, um, between the correlation between persistence in your expeditions um, and persistence in your life. So the correlation between the two. The more aligned you are with yourself and uh, with the purpose that you're going in life, the more persistent you can become. It's very hard to become persistent um, when you are not aligning your yourself to a purposefully driven life. And the reason I say that is because, you know, uh, your purpose could be your North Star, whatever you want to call it. It's something that's always uh, right there in front of you, but it's not fully refined or defined. Your purpose should never be uh, sharply defined, but you know the trajectory in the direction where it goes. And there's a lot of different passions and a lot of different things that lead to that purpose. And to me, that, that, that um, trajectory from where I am now to the North Star, which I will never reach, but I strive to, to, to move in that direction, is that persistence. And so I feel exactly the same way when I'm doing my expeditions. 
I feel like I am, uh, I don't even necessarily need a North Star because I know what the goal is. The goal is to make it to point uh, B. And uh, to me, that's what leads my persistence. It's like, I just think about the fact that I need to get to point B. And if you keep drilling yourself with that notion, nothing can really stop you, right? Because um, a lot of obstacles in Africa, for instance, tried to stop me, uh, not on purpose, but, but it, you know, like, you know, getting shot at by the rebels. Um, so I had soldiers try to shoot me. I had, um, I had seen things and experienced things that would traumatize, uh, I think, <laughs> uh, the everyday uh, individual person. And uh, I've been sick, I've been, you know, bitten by dogs, attacked by dogs. So all those things could have stopped me. But the number one thing that could have stopped me really was my own mind, my brain. And how do you keep that going? And the way I kept that going was uh, I would never be as hard on myself as people like to believe. Because I took everything into bite-sized um, situations. And then those bite-sized situations eventually lead up to the entirety of an expedition. So that could mean like uh, kayaking Lake Ontario, for instance. My goal would, I would split my day up in, in three separate goals. So one would be, okay, like uh, morning to lunch. Uh, I got to make it through that. <laughs> okay, cool. And then I don't really think about the other ones, although I had already planned it out. I would plan it out and I would forget about it because I would know what to do. And then by the time I get to lunch, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm at lunch. Now the next goal is like, cool. Now I got to make it to dinner, you know? And then I would just like keep making these like little missions and those little missions, you make, you, you make it fun. You make it positive and you keep moving forward. And that's what's going to get you to the end. A lot, I see a lot of people who suffer through in life, but also um, on expeditions because they see the negative too much. They would complain. As soon as you start complaining, you have, you're doomed. Um, as soon as you start focusing on the negative, there's a lot of things that could be negative, then again, you're doomed. So there are a lot of um, uh, situations where I don't need to force myself to think positively because to me, it's the positive thing is to make it to the end. <laughs> You know, so that's what I focus on. And uh, you split that up in, in, in tangible bite-sized um, portions. Thank you. Um, we have a, a message from Mariam Batty, all the way from Dublin, Ireland, who says, thanks for the words of encouragement, Mario. I love cycling and nature. I've always wanted to cycle the wild Atlantic way here in Ireland. Now I feel like I just, I just need to do it. Um, I'll keep an eye on what you're doing next on Twitter, seeing that you are active there. Um, at this point, Mary, I want to thank you. And I want to um, recap some of the themes you talk about, especially when it comes to the issue around recognition. Um, I mean, you may know we are all part of the International Decade for People of African Descent. And one of the things on that has been the issue around recognition. You know, people always like to say, why do you care about recognition? And I tell them, just wait till you start to do things and start to work harder things. And everybody decides that they would take it and give it to somebody else. And you know, then mm. you, you start to know what it really feels like until, um, until you get that experience yourself, you may not understand it. And empathy is a key thing, right? So Absolutely. try to empathize with people's situations. Like we said, even with our own indigenous communities that we actually met here. And this is one thing I wanna encourage many people who are newcomers to Canada, make it an effort to understand about the plight of our indigenous communities. It is extremely important because in the entire immigration process, nobody tells you about it. It is not apparent in the immigration process, so you don't get to know about it. But I will say to newcomers, when you get here, make an honest effort to learn about it and, 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 and make sure it is part of your integration process here so that you understand where we are, what Canada really is, and don't wait till someone gives it to you. Um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to give us your final words, um, Mario, and I also wanna thank everybody. Um, I may not have been able to take all of the questions. We wanna respect everybody's time, but I want to thank everybody out there on Facebook, on Instagram, and those who join us on Zoom. Over 40 people join us this evening from around the world, from Africa, from Ireland, um, many other parts of Europe, and as well as Canada. We really want to thank all of you for joining us. And Mary, I will let you say your final words, and then we can wrap up the evening. 
Thank you so much, uh, Leo. And uh, again, uh, just doing this in itself is, is supporting our, our community as well. Um, you know, the more diversity we have in the world, in any field, the better it is for all of us. And my argument to people who resist that is, you know, to look deeper um, within yourself because it's not just about doing a good thing for someone else, it's doing a good thing for yourself. If you have multiple people, more people involved in environmental uh, cleanup or, uh, you know, in education and whatnot, the more doctors you will have to save you, the more people you will have focusing on sustainable energy, the quicker renewable energy um, resources will be spread around the world. It is not a matter of do you like this person or not. It's a matter of are you a participant in the global affairs of humanity or are you stuck in a bubble? And right now we can no longer afford to be stuck in bubbles because we've realized that they're not actually bubbles. Whatever happens in one part of the world will affect the other part of the world. You know, so yeah. we, we as a people need to really focus on the broader picture. And that broader picture has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with uh, being male or female. It has to do with the fact that, you know, we need to collaborate and we need to figure it out quickly. And I think that um, a message uh, such as, you know, uh, a saying that we need to all work together in order to achieve a better humanity, I think is the, the best way to go forward. And we need to do that before we go to Mars. Yeah, I agree. What is what is the next adventure? People people want to, want, want to know. I know John from Hillfield was very particular about that, but what is the next um, adventure for you, Maria? So we're working on a, a expedition called Caicos Challenge, which is, it's gonna take me to Turks and Caicos for the first time uh, to do an expedition there. And it is to traverse the Caicos Islands. There are seven main islands that I'm gonna run, uh, hike, kayak, bike, and swim across. And it should take me roughly um, uh, six days to traverse. And um, the way that we're actually making this a part of a global community is by having people from around the world join in while I'm doing a leg of my expedition. I would want people from around the world to join me on that leg of the expedition by doing their own challenge that is equal to the challenge that I'm doing. So if I'm burning 10,000 calories on a 200 kilometer bike ride, um, I would want that person to challenge that. And you know those challenges will lead up to something because we're also linking up with charitable organizations and education programs in Turks and Caicos to help uplift the youth so that we have a sustainable future as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mario. Some of you might be wondering why Empowerment Square brought Mario down. Um, this is part of our thought leadership um, um, efforts at Empowerment Squared. Some of you may remember we brought um, the 2011 Nobel Peace Laureate to Hamilton when COVID was not a thing in person, where she delivered a life-changing um, um, engagement um, here for everybody. We also brought Daba Mandela, Nelson Mandela's grandson, um, to Hamilton. We would have loved to have Mario sitting in a room and chatting with everybody after this event, unfortunately. But this cannot stop us from continuing our initiative and our efforts around thought leadership, because we believe as Hamiltonians, as Canadians, we need to tap into the expertise, experiences, and knowledge of people who have gone places that some of us may never be able to go or have never gone, but tap into the lessons that they've learned and that they have to share with us so that as we deal with our own struggles every day, or as we take on new challenges every day, we are tapping into a wealth of different experiences to help us navigate our world. Because after all, it is a multicultural world and we will have to engage with so many other people. Again, I want to thank everybody. It has been an amazing time and enjoy the rest of your week. My name is Leo Napolu Johnson and I am the Executive Director of Empowerment Squared and I had the pleasure of being your host um, tonight. Thank you everybody. <laughs>